device a little bit like a, like a pacemaker. 
So as I said, today we're going to focus mainly on this one, but a lot of the ideas sort of um, uh, can transfer across various different uh, parts. So again, back to electro, uh, electromagnetism, uh, electromagnetic induction. Um, this is sort of the basis behind uh, transparent magnetic stimulation. So as we said before, remember our right hand rule, um, if you create an electric current, you get a magnetic field. And so in this case, we've got some copper wires that sort of run around in a coil, and you pass a really, really quick electric current through these coils, which creates a magnetic field which passes through the scout. When you do this in time varying fashion, so it's just really quick, we're talking about 200 microseconds, so really, really fast, um, what you actually do is you create another electric field uh, in, in conducting tissue, for example, neural tissue. So you're actually creating an electric field in the neural tissue of the brain, and if you do this at sufficient intensities, you can actually cause the neurons of the brain to fire. Now, this is a pretty cool concept, I think. You're actually externally making the brain fire. That's pretty cool. So um, if you move this around to different regions of the brain, you can stimulate different areas. So for example, if you put it over the area of the brain that controls the hand, you can make the hand move, um, you can make the leg move. If you put it over the visual fields, you can interrupt um, vision and get what are called phosphines, you know, those flashes of light that you often see. So it's, um, it's pretty cool. Now I've got a video here, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but this is um, just, it's just us in the lab stuffing around, um, just stimulating a motor region. So hopefully we here. We hear the click, the click is the, the device going off. What you're looking for is wherever Neil's hand reaches here. You can see as the click goes off, Neil's hand's actually moving. So he's not doing anything, he's just sitting there nice and relaxed, and his hand's actually been activated by us, which is um, <laughs> yeah, kind of cool. So yeah. you're active on the motor? It's on the motor strip, yeah, so just on his, his motor region. But if you're active on the visual cortex, do you see something? Flashes is white. And you can actually move around in different areas of the visual field and you can make the flashes of light change in terms of like relative to the mapping of the visual cortex. So you can actually, it's quite a, um, a flexible technique, uh, Tina. So you can use it in lots of different ways to try and, and look at, at brain function. So the, um, the top two here, cortical excitation inhibition and cortical connectivity, are sort of a perturbational approach. So you are um, perturbing the brain and then you're seeing how it behaves. Essentially, and by doing that in various different ways, you can get information um, on specific excitation and inhibition circuits within the brain. Um, and you can also look at the connecti connectivity of one brain region to another brain region. There's also this idea of virtual lesions. So you can use the, the stimulation kind of, if you like, a knockout kind of a model where you are actually trying to interrupt brain function. So um, by doing this, you can apply it to different brain regions to try and see whether they're involved in a, in a task, for example. And there's also then this idea of neuromodulation. So in this, in both of these, you sort of this one's more like a snapshot of the brain, taking sort of snapshots of how the brain's actually working or organised. Um, this one's sort of a bit more of an online causal activation approach. This one you're actually trying to change brain function over a period of time. So you're using the stimulation to actually try and change um, the way that the brain's organised essentially. So we're just going to work our way through each of these examples. So to, to get these cortical excitation inhibition circuits, you actually need to be measuring some kind of an output. So as I showed before, you can do this quite easily in the motor system because you, you stimulate um, the motor areas up here. This sort of sends a signal down to the, the muscle, the, the region of the brain that's stimulating the controls. And then you can actually measure those pulses. And you saw we had some electrodes on Neil's hand there. And they get measured in terms of what's called a motor or potential or any. And the size of uh, this response can be taken as an index of corticospinal excitability. So the excitability of this entire system. And you can do a similar kind of thing with phosphines. So you can either increase or decrease um, intensity and look at the, either the size or the occurrence of phosphines in the individual field. So um, neurophysiologists have devised a heap of different ways of trying to actually look at specific circuits within the brain using uh, what's called single or, or paired pulse techniques. So the idea here is that when you stimulate a region of the brain with a single pulse, what you actually do is you cause a mass synchronisation of firing of neurons. So you're getting both excitatory and inhibitory neurons um, and they're all releasing the neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters um, bind to the receptors and different kinds of neurotransmitters and receptors, uh, sorry, different kinds of receptors have different uh, time courses over which they work. 
So, for example, AMP receptors, which are glutamatergic um, uh, receptors, are very fast. They sort of work over a one to two millisecond time frame. Uh, GABA A receptors are a little bit longer. They sort of work in sort of the, the five to twenty millisecond time frame. Um, NMDA receptors, another type of glutamatergic receptor, a little bit longer again. So they work sort of over the fifteen to thirty millisecond time range. And then you've got another kind of GABA. Emerging receptor called GABA B receptors, which operate over a very long time range, so they can go a couple hundred milliseconds. So the idea is that you get the synchronous activity and then you get this fluctuation in cortical excitability um, relative to how all these different receptor properties work essentially. And what you can do is you can actually condition um, this test box. So for example, if you if you want to look at the, the GABA A mediated inhibition, you provide a little pulse before your main pulse, and then you see how that changes the size of your cortical spinal excitability in terms of the MEP. So the blue line here is just this test pulse by itself. When you put a little sub-threshold pulse in before, so it's not enough to give a um, give a motor evoke potential, but it is enough to, to get these inhibitory interneurons, um, you see that the size of the MEP reduces. And you can express this as a percentage um, of this test pulse alone, and it gives you some kind of an index of how these inhibitory circuits are working. If you move a little bit further out, like over here, and um, into what would be more in terms of the glutamatergic uh, receptors, so around sort of 15 millisecond mark, you actually see the opposite. So now instead of being reduced, you see that the, the paired pulse in red here is actually increased relative to the, the test pulse alone. So this is considered um, not called intracortical facilitation and potentially measures NDA uh, mediated. Excitation. And again, if you go much further out now, this is looking at sort of the GABA B mediated inhibition. Um, you can see again, if you head out to these longer time intervals, it now the, the pulse reduces. Um, you can also look at this in terms of single pulse during a contraction. So here, people are making a contraction, they've got background muscle activity. If you give a pulse during this, there's actually a period afterwards where there's no muscle activity. Um, this is sort of generally a combination of inhibition within the spinal cord, which lasts for about 50 milliseconds. Once you get out to sort of 100 to 200 milliseconds, this is thought to reflect uh, cortical inhibition, very similar to sort of this gamma being mediated inhibition measured by this technique. So, what you can do with this in the motor cortex is um, measure this between two different groups. So, again, this has um, been done a lot in schizophrenia, and you can actually build these wiring diagrams um, of how the motor cortex is organised. So, you've got the pyramidal cells here, which are the output cells that result, uh, result in the MEP. And then you've got all these other little um, interneurons which you're getting with the TMS that sort of all connect up onto each other. And you, these are the different sort of cells that you're targeting with your, your head pulse techniques. And in schizophrenia, uh, very nicely, we talked, spoke before about GABA A mediated, uh, GABA A receptor problems in schizophrenia and GABA power. Um, we can actually directly test um, that GABA A mediated inhibition using these, these TMS paradigms. And it's probably um, the the most consistent finding in schizophrenia in the TMS um, literature is this decrease in short interval intracortical inhibition, which is thought to be mediated by GABA yeah, right. So, moving on to our next one now, cortical connectivity. So, following a similar kind of idea now, instead of applying sort of the two pulses over the same region, what you can do is you can actually use two coils and stimulate one region and then see what effect that has on your motor cortical output. So, um, in this case here, we're looking at intra hemispheric, um, interhemispheric, sorry, uh, connectivity. So, in this case, you would um, stimulate the conditioning hemisphere over here first. That then sends sort of these connections over into the, into the target hemisphere. And then, at certain time points, um, when you stimulate here, you, you get, again, inhibition. Um, and it happens at quite uh, quite nice time points, one around about 10 milliseconds, and then you get another wave of inhibition around about 40 milliseconds as well. And you can do a similar thing with the, um, the silent period as you do, um, except in this time, you, it's a little bit confusing this because um, your motor cortex obviously uh, uh, controls your contralateral hand. So if you stimulate this hemisphere here while you're making a contraction with this hand, which is dependent on this hemisphere, um, you see that you get a similar little silent period out here that you see if you were actually um, contracting this hand. So this is another measure of inhibition across um, the hemispheres. Does that make sense? It's a little bit confusing, but um, if you think about it, it kind of <laughs> makes sense. Um, so again, this has been done quite extensively in schizophrenia, and you can create these wiring diagrams of 
how the how the, the cortex is sort of uh, organised. And again, it's quite interesting with this short hemispheric inhibition um, is again really robustly uh, de uh, deficient in people with schizophrenia. And you can't can not just do this um, necessarily over the, the two hemispheres, but you can look at other areas. So um, you can look at, for example, the premotor cortex. So um, stimulate that, and then stimulate the motor cortex, uh, the parietal cortex, and also the, the cerebellum. And all of these can show to be deficient in schizophrenia. So sort of speaking into this uh, disruption in cortical connectivity. So I'm just um, going to put a little bit of a plug in here as well. We've um, just for my PhD, which I've just completed, we've also been trying to combine this with EEG. So instead of me indirectly measuring uh, the output through the motor system, uh, we wanted to try and measure it from areas like prefrontal cortex, which don't have a really obvious output. So the um, way that we thought potentially around this would be to actually directly measure the TMS mode activity from the cortex using EEG. Um, it's a great idea, it has a lot of problems because uh, magnetic pulse generated by TMS causes all kinds of troubles with EEG systems. But we're actually able to do it um, eventually. And we, this M100 here, um, we've sort of shown in a couple of different experiment, experiments behaves very similarly to our cortical inhibition um, paradigms around that cortical silent period. So we sort of thought that this might be some kind of direct index of cortical inhibition and you can see again that's really reduced in schizophrenia in, in the red here. And you can also look at um, TMS evoked oscillations. So now where instead of people having to do a task or listen to a stimulus, we can just stimulate the brain and see how it behaves essentially. So if you break that down into the frequency domain, you can see that we stimulated over this left frontal region here and really quite nicely the, the amount of gamma that we could um, induced was reduced not just at the prefrontal cortex but also at distant regions as well in the parietal cortex and in sort of these other beta regions directly across that frontal band. So now sort of a little bit of a change of approach. So instead of now sort of measuring an output, what we're actually trying to do is disrupt regular brain function. So as you can imagine, sort of this idea of having a lot of neurons firing at the same time is quite unnatural for so it doesn't happen very often at all, essentially. So the idea is that by doing this, um, by causing this uh, really synchronous firing, you may in some way that it actually interrupt with whatever function the brain, is, that area of the brain is actually undertaking at the moment. So uh, this has been really jumped on by, by cognitive um, neuroscientists because it's in some way uh, uh, what's called a causal, uh, allows some causal inference. If you, stimulate this region and it knocks out function, therefore this region is involved in that function. It's obviously not quite that simple because as we saw before, when you stimulate a region, don't just stimulate that region, you stimulate all the outputs from that region as well. Um, so you get larger networks than just the one applied. So I wish I could find a video for this, but I couldn't unfortunately. But this is um, really quite amazing to see when it's done in terms of speech rest. So when you put it over some of the speech areas of the brain, um, people sort of, you just show them pictures and they say words. You start applying the TMS, you show them the pictures and they don't say anything. It's, um, it's really quite freaky. It's apparently quite unnerving when you actually do this. So you just, you can see it, you tell you, yourself to say it, but you don't say anything. It's, um, it's freaky. And so what they can do is you can sort of, um, if you couple this with some kind of a, um, with someone's MRI in 3D space, you can actually sort of go around and stimulate different regions map those and then see which ones cause the speech rest and which ones don't. And they're actually using this now in, um, in preparation for, for some neurosurgeries. So they've actually commercialised this as a device and you can actually map these functions out really nicely. Um, so now the, the final one we're going to talk about is, is neuromodulation. So this is actually trying to change the brain a little bit over a period of time that goes beyond the period of stimulation. So this is working sort of in, in, a, in models of plasticity essentially. And what, what happened back in the, um, in the early 90s, um, there's obviously lots of classical models in, in animals and in, in slice experiments of long-term potentiation, long-term depression, these changes in synaptic efficacy that can be brought about by repetitively firing these, these, um, these synapses. And depending on the pattern of stimulation, you can either increase or decrease the snap efficacy of these regions. Some guys sort of thought, well, maybe we can try and do this with 
patterns and see if we apply these patterns of TMS, can we change corticospinal um, cortical excitability beyond our period of stimulation? What they did is they pretty much took these paradigms straight, nearly straight from the, um, from the animal literature. And so generally in repetitive TMS, these low frequency um, simulations are about one hertz, so once every second, you just apply the simulation along. If you measure corticospinal excitability beforehand, for example, with your MEPs, um, what happens is those actually get smaller, and that lasts for around about half an hour after the simulation. If you increase the intensity, say, uh, sorry, increase the frequency up to say um, above 5 hertz, so either 5, 10, or 20 hertz, um, it does the opposite. Essentially, you get an increase in excitability, which is kind of in line with these, uh, these models of SNAP. And uh, just uh, interesting as well, if you keep doing this, you can actually uh, induce seizures. So you've got to be a little bit careful, and this, is, um, this results in having to sort of plan these out so that you've got plenty of spaces. So here, if you're going up to 20 hertz, you can only sort of <coughs> two seconds, and then you need to give about a 28 um, second rest. So this doesn't really map well in terms of um, biology. So some more bio biologically inspired uh, patterns have come out, such as theta burst stimulation. We spoke a little bit in the last talk about theta gamma coupling. Uh, this essentially mimics that idea. So what you get is um, at 200 milliseconds, you get a pulse, which is around about the theta frequency, so around about five hertz. But within these little pulses here, you actually get a burst of three stimuli. So and these are at really high frequencies, around that gamma frequency of about 50 hertz. So you've got these little 50 hertz um, stimuli embedded within a slower um, five hertz stimuli. And again, if you give these uh, in a continuous sense, so if you just sort of, um, these only take around about 90 seconds, so you apply the simulation for 90 seconds in a continuous fashion, you get this decrease in excitability. If you uh, do it in an intermittent fashion, um, so you give little breaks over a little bit longer, uh, you get an increase in excitability. And again, it maps really nicely on some of the animal literature. Um, the third method is Again, on this change of SNAP to the FPC, looking more at, a, um, at spike time dependent plasticity. So uh, it's called pair associative stimulation. What you're doing now is you're actually stimulating a nerve uh, out here, which sends a somatosensory remote potential up into the, into the cortex, and then you're trying to time your TMS pulse to when that arrives. Um, so by changing the timing, so um, you can either, again, increase it around about the 25 millisecond mark, so these are roughly coincidental. If you change it so that the TMS pulse is actually arriving before the sensory remote potential, you actually get a decrease uh, in excitability. So, again, these map really well onto, onto some of the animal literature. And the nice thing about these models of plasticity is that you can actually use them to test um, potentially deficient plasticity, again, in in people with different disorders. So this has been done, for example, using the associative stimulation technique in people with, with schizophrenia. So again, you sort of you test your the corticospinal excitability at baseline, give this pair associative stimulation for about half an hour, and then test the corticospinal excitability out up to an hour. And you can see there's a little bit of a lag in terms of when this takes up, but in the health controls in white here, the size of their MEPs increase over time, and you see there's no change at all. Suggesting that plasticity uh, might be deficient. So the really cool thing about this, um, as well, is that this idea that you can actually change the brain over time lends itself really nicely to treatment. So if you've got a um, in a disorder an area of the brain that's potentially underactive or overactive, you can try and use these techniques to increase or decrease the excitability of those regions. Um, this is a little bit different in terms of um, it's, it's applied in a more cumulative way. So people generally will need to come into a clinic and receive around about half an hour of stimulation daily for between one to four weeks. Um, trying to get, so as you saw with that other one, uh, the other, when you just give it in a single session, the effects only last for about an hour. So the idea behind giving it daily over a long period of time is you're trying to increase the, the length of time that these changes persist. And possibly one of the really nice examples, again, in schizophrenia, was applying this over these temporoparietal regions that have been shown to be overactive during verbal hallucinations. So what the, uh, these experimenters did was they, they took people who applied the coil over this region, applied an inhibitory paradigm, so the one hertz paradigm, and then looked at the, um, the, the, the number of hallucinations that happened after that, 
And this is over oh, seven days of treatment. As you can see, a really nice decrease here in an active stimulation group um, and no change at all in a sham stimulation group. But this is more commonly been done um, in depression. Uh, so uh, my supervisor, Paul, has a really large clinic that stimulates the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex at various different frequencies. And it's been quite reasonably successful. Around right? about 20 to 30% of people with treatment resistant depression actually have um, a response to this kind of treatment. So. Alright, so again, just to summarise uh, this technique relative to, to some of the others, um, the advantages are that it's, it's not invasive. Um, you can have some kind of causal inference with the technique, which is quite nice. Again, it's relatively inexpensive once you've got the equipment. Um, and there's various different neuro neurophysiological paradigms uh, that we can use to assess really specific cortical mechanisms, uh, which is really nice. Um, so some of the disadvantages, a lot of these things which I've shown have been in, uh, in the motor cortex because you need to, to measure an output. So it's a little bit limiting, obviously, with diseases which probably don't involve the motor cortex, but as I said, we might be able to get around some of this using combinations of other neuroimaging techniques. Um, just a sort of a practical note, it can be a little bit uncomfortable over regions like prefrontal cortex, particularly anywhere near where there's muscle, because you can uh, inadvertently stimulate muscle, and that can be a little bit uncomfortable. This um, is also a risk of seizure, um, because we're actually stimulating the brain here. So there's very strict safety guidelines that you can operate within to try and minimise this as much as you possibly can, but it's certainly something which needs to be kept in mind. It means in certain subject populations, if they're at high risk of, of seizure, the, for example, epilepsy, it's not necessarily the um, best technique. And then when you're using it in sort of a, tr a treatment sense, it is quite time intensive, particularly for the participants, because they need to come into a clinic every day um, over up to a month. <coughs> so um, for some people, that's, um, that's not ideal. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, practically they usually do it just week, uh, week daily. So, um, sort of, yeah, just to have the weekends on. But then, uh, sort of, it's a fairly active area of research because it's not really clear what the defining factor is in terms of the, the clinical effect. So, whether it's the amount of stimulation, whether it's the, the frequency of the stimulation. So, what they're trying out is they're actually trying to give, instead of giving the five treatments over five days, they're classing down to five treatments over two days. Um, and just seeing whether that has the same kind of effect as giving them a little bit of that whole treatment time. So they're starting to play around with some of these parameters now just to see whether you can make it a little bit more um, user friendly essentially for the participants. Can I just ask one more? You It's a little bit harder just because of the muscles, some of the muscles are a bit harder to, to measure because it's not as um, not as close to the to the skin. You can certainly do it, there's lots of papers that, um, that have done yeah. that. So yeah. So you actually elicit uh, Yeah, it twitches in the, yeah. the face. So it's, it's also a bit hard as well because it's over the jaw area. So you actually directly activate the muscle as well as activating it through the cortex. So you sort of get that's why it's, it's yeah, that's why it's tough, but um, it certainly can be done. You just need to be careful with it. How oh, is it the stimulation? Are you sort of stimulating sheets of cortex, or is it quite directly? Yeah, it's, um, so again, it's depending on your coil design. You can, there's different designs for different levels of locality. So the figure eight coil, which was in the demonstration, is probably the most focal one. So you actually get sort of two magnetic fields, and you get a, a cumulative effect at the, at the center of the two figure eights. That's generally thought to sort of get a, a patch of cortex around about that, but there's a bit of debate at the moment in terms of how much cortex you're actually getting because it's, it's based a lot on um, on modelling essentially. So, and I mean the electric field has quite complex interactions with things like cerebrospinal fluid and and other different kinds of tissue. So it's um yeah, there's a little bit of debate in terms of how much it actually gets, and depending on what kind of modelling you use, it changes quite a fair bit. But um, yeah, it's it's. It's a reasonable patch of cortex, it's quite big. I saw something there at the beginning about deep TMS. So, yeah. 
I thought it was sort of a coral surface sort of thing. How deep were you able to go? So the, the so like figure eight, the usual ones around about two centimeters. The um, the H corals, which I use in the, the D T M S, we operate around about to five, five to six centimeters. So that's uh, everything from the surface to five centimeters down to the whole whole. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So generally, they use that to try and target either the medial prefrontal cortex or the anterior cingulate cortex. But yeah, you're right. It gets everything on the way down. So you're, you're getting the the outer layer as well as 